It reminds me of that sketch. Have you seen it? The one from Monty Python on the Holy Grail, where King Arthur reads the Aramaic carving on the wall of the cave, where Joseph carves ah into the wall as he dies while writing. <laughs> like Graham Chapman said in the film, he wouldn't bother to carve ah, he'd just say it, right? I highly doubt the Roanoke colonists would carve Croatoan as they were being murdered by the Croatoans, now would they? Welcome to A Popular History of Unpopular Things, where we love all things weird, gross, and bloody disgusting. My name is Kelly Beard, and today we're going to look at the U.S.'s oldest mystery, the missing colonists of Roanoke Island. So back in school, we learned that the first permanent English colony in the Americas was Jamestown. In 1607, over a hundred Englishmen created a settlement at Jamestown named after their king, James I. And though it was hard, friendly relations with local indigenous groups like the Powhatans led to the colony's success, cementing its place in American history. However, Jamestown was not the first English settlement in the New World. Twenty years earlier, in 1587, a group of 118 settlers established a colony at Roanoke Island in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. But unlike Jamestown, the Roanoke colony failed. More than that, it just disappeared, along with all of the settlers who tried to forge a life in America. To this day, we still don't know the actual location of the Roanoke settlement, nor do we conclusively know what happened to its people. What we do know is that its leader, John White, was sent back to England to gather more supplies to help the colony. And when he returned, everyone was gone, and the Roanoke colony had vanished. So today, we're going to do a deep dive into history to find out what happened to the Roanoke colony. Why did they settle at Roanoke? Why did they have to send John White back to England for supplies? What might have happened to the Roanoke colonists? Now, in previous episodes, like the Dyatlov Pass incident, I presented the story as a mystery, and I invited you to solve alongside me. But this time, we're going to go back to my roots as a big-picture world historian. I want to take a step back and look at the context here. What was happening in the world that led to a settlement at Roanoke in 1587? And more importantly, was there something going on, something global in scale, that might explain why it failed? In short, yeah. There were global forces at play that are partially responsible for the failure of the Roanoke colony, and as a result, its settlers were left abandoned in an unfamiliar new world. Today we're going to take a look at the history of the lost Roanoke colony. I'll provide the necessary historical background, or context, before I introduce my thesis for what went horribly wrong. Then, we'll sort through what information we do have from a variety of archaeological and written sources, like the maps and journals of Roanoke leader John White. Finally, we'll take a look at how modern-day historians are using technology to try to uncover the truth of the lost Roanoke colony. So let's get started. Our story begins in the late 16th century with a man named Sir Walter Raleigh. Now, Raleigh was a man obsessed with two things, creating an English colony in the New World and Queen Elizabeth I. Now, to fully understand the story, we need to understand what the world looked like in the 16th century. You guessed it, it's time for some historical context. My favorite! So the 16th century was the period when religious tensions were at an all-time high. The Protestant Reformation in 1517, led by Martin Luther, fractured Western Catholicism. This also happened, in part, because literacy rates were on the rise. The inventor Johann Gutenberg adapted some Chinese technology into what we call the printing press. Using this new machine, printers were able to create books at a faster rate in the vernacular, or local language. The most widely printed book, both then and now, was the Bible. So prior to widespread literacy, people trusted their priests to hear stories from the Bible. And as literacy improved, people read the Bible for themselves, and they noticed some differences in what was written versus what their priests were telling them. Long story short and simplified, it led to a split in Christianity. There was Catholicism, centered around the Pope in Southern Europe, and Protestantism, more prominent in Northern Europe. Okay, so why am I telling you this? Well... By the late 16th century, religious tensions had become intertwined with political tensions. So we all know who's responsible for the onslaught of colonization in this period of time, right? Y you do, I promise you do. 
In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Yeah, we all know that one. At least those of you who grew up in the U.S. education system. Columbus sailed for the Spanish and ended up inspiring waves upon waves of explorers to conquer the New World. The Spanish were the most successful at this. The Spanish were also heavily Roman Catholic. It's why Spanish-speaking countries in Central and South America today are also predominantly Roman Catholic, because one of the main aspects of colonization was conversion. Okay, real quick tangent. We have to go back even further to explain why the Spanish, and later the English, were so fixated on converting people to their respective religions. So it was only the century before, the 15th century, that the Spanish had led their Reconquista movement. Their main goal was to remove the Muslims, who had been living in what later becomes Spain, since the 700s. They were there for a long time. And Reconquista was successful. But on the other side of the Mediterranean, Muslim forces under the Ottoman Empire were pushing into Europe. For those of you who listened to my podcast on Elizabeth Bathory, the Blood Countess, you may remember that her husband, Ferenc Nadozhdi, spent most of his adult life fighting the Muslim Turks, who were encroaching on Hungarian land. My point is, Christians were still pretty afraid that Muslims were going to conquer Europe. And when you factor in the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century, Catholics in particular are feeling pretty marginalized. They've got the Muslims to the south, they've got non-Catholics now to the north, they're losing followers rapidly, which means the church is losing money. So what's their solution? Well, let's baptize and convert an entire continent of people in the Americas. Not only will that help bolster the church's finances, but it will help re-legitimize Catholicism as the predominant Christian faith. Okay, back to where we left off, but I promise you that was all important stuff. Because the Spanish, by the late 16th century, that's the late 1500s, had colonized much of Central and South America, even portions of the U.S., Remember, even when the Donner Party was traveling west in 1846, Mexico was still in control of much of the American Southwest. And in case you couldn't tell, that was in fact another shameless plug to get you to listen to more of my podcast episodes. Now, England was not Catholic. Henry VIII, back in 1534, established the Church of England, or the Anglican Church, as a subset of Protestantism. And while they tolerated other Protestants, they were super intolerant of Catholics, so you can imagine they didn't get on well with the Spanish. But mixed with this religious dispute was a political one. The Spanish king was trying to take lands north of France in what later becomes Belgium and the Netherlands, and even worse, there are rumors that they want to invade England, depose Queen Elizabeth, and replace her with her Catholic sister, Mary Queen of Scots. At first, Elizabeth wants to be able to compete with the Spanish wealth coming out of the New World, and one way she could do that was through piracy. She called it privateering, but it was just state-sponsored piracy. Captains, like the fabled Sir Francis Drake, were often sent over to harass Spanish ships from Nova Scotia and Canada, all the way down to the Caribbean and the north coast of South America. But Sir Walter Raleigh saw an opportunity to mix the two things he loved most, an English colony in the New World and being in Queen Elizabeth's favor. Taking advantage of the precarious political situation with Spain, Raleigh pitched an idea to create an English settlement in the New World, somewhere north of Spanish Florida. The idea was that privateers like Francis Drake could use this English colony as a base of operations to harass the Spanish ships sailing by on their way home to Spain. So long story short and simplified, Raleigh thought that somewhere between what is now the Outer Banks of North Carolina and the Lower Chesapeake Bay in Virginia was the perfect spot. He pitched this idea to his beloved queen, and she agreed, giving him a charter to settle land in what he would later call Virginia, named after Elizabeth, who was called the Virgin Queen. It's because she was never married, by the way. That's why she got that nickname. In 1585, Raleigh sent some men on an expedition to do some reconnaissance. Fact-finding, if you will. What area would be the best for the first English colony? When the men stumbled upon the Outer Banks, they marveled at how it was hard to penetrate by enemy ships because of how shallow the sound is within those barrier islands, so they set up camp at a place called Roanoke. This wasn't THE Roanoke colony, but the men did stay here for a while. 
And in the end, the reconnaissance mission determined that the Chesapeake Bay region was actually the best, as the indigenous groups they encountered there were generally friendly, tolerant of the English, and willing to help trade with them for food. So armed with this knowledge, Walter Raleigh prepared an expedition to settle in the New World, the first attempt at an English colony. 118 men, women, and children were sent over in two ships, led by one of his friends, the artist and mapmaker John White. So the actual plan was to stop over in Roanoke for a day or so. Before leaving, all the way back in 1585, the first reconnaissance mission, they left behind a small contingent of 15 soldiers. So the plan was to pick these men up and then go ahead north to the Chesapeake Bay, hugging the coastline to find a good place to settle. But when the crew arrived at Roanoke, the 15 men they had left behind had vanished. This mystery was easy to solve, though. They found bleached bones at the settlement, indicating the men died there, but were more likely killed by some indigenous groups. Let me explain. Now, when the reconnaissance group first arrived in 1585, they were led by a man named Ralph Lane. Initially, Lane and his crew were quite happy with how peaceful the indigenous were and traded with several different groups. In letters he wrote to friends back home, he called some of the leaders grave and wise, complimenting them on their disposition and willingness to help the Englishmen, but this relationship changed. At some point, Lane led an expedition inland from Roanoke, and he encountered some trouble. Some of his personal things went missing, and he blamed the indigenous. Long story short and simplified, this escalated to violence, with Lane's men killing several dozen indigenous men. To say that relations were soured between the English and indigenous Americans would be an understatement. So when Lane's men were left behind on Roanoke to watch the fort, it was no surprise they were killed. Payback, if you will. Now, interestingly enough, John White, the leader of the Roanoke settlement, he was on that reconnaissance mission from 1585, so he knew of these tense relations. However, there were some friends among the New World's inhabitants, chiefly the Croatoans. One of the Croatoans, Manteo, had been traveling with the English for the past few years and served as a translator. He and his people were incredibly patient with the English, helping them out with food when the noobs had trouble farming or fishing, so not everyone in the New World had it out for them. But here's where things start to deviate from the plan. In 1587, John White and his settlers were only supposed to touch base with Roanoke before moving on to the Chesapeake Bay but the man piloting the ships decided that he had spent enough time carting English settlers around, so he ditched them there. We're not sure if this was done as a surprise, or if John White decided to deviate from the plan, but the outcome is the same. The colonists were left at Roanoke to create a new settlement, not the Chesapeake Bay. Now, why the boat wanted to ditch them is more clear. English ships in 1587 make most of their money privateering, that is, pirating, Spanish galleons. The Spanish colonies were mining tons in gold and silver from their colonies, most notably some gold mines in present-day Mexico and silver mines at Potosí in present-day Bolivia. By raiding these Spanish ships, the English were accomplishing several goals. First, they were harassing the heck out of Spain, their political and religious enemy. Second, they were taking Spanish money. And third, they were eliminating ships from their enemy's armada. So the pilot ditched the Roanoke colonists in July 1587 so he could spend the rest of the summer off privateering, a much more profitable venture than carting families around the Atlantic. Now, it didn't take long for the Roanoke colonists to encounter trouble. Only a few days after arriving, one man was shot with dozens of arrows while bathing in a stream. Some of the indigenous folk who remembered Lane from years ago were clearly still hostile to the English who slaughtered their people. Relations weren't great. So the colonists were stuck on Roanoke, surrounded by potentially hostile indigenous Americans, and without enough supplies to survive the winter on their own. They had assumed that they could trade for what they needed, but they did not anticipate that their new neighbors were not so forthcoming. So they all rallied around their leader, John White, and encouraged him to sail home to England to ask his friend Sir Walter Raleigh for more supply ships. After all, this was Walter Raleigh's dream an English colony in the New World that put him in favor with his queen and would make him famous. Since John White was his friend, he was the best choice to go. But White reluctantly agrees, because he had to leave behind his daughter, Eleanor, who accompanied him on the trip. And more than that, Eleanor had just given birth to the first English citizen ever born in the New World, little Virginia Dare. <laughs> 
but it was their best chance to survive, so John White leaves. You ready for this? It took him three years to be able to return. He doesn't get back there until 1590. And when he returned, he found nothing. The only thing left standing in the Roanoke colony he left behind was the wooden palisade, which is a rudimentary defensive wall made of sharpened logs. They were common in all early English settlements. But other than that, nothing. No people, no homes, no bones, nothing. It was as if they were never there to begin with. Now, before he left, John White and his people agreed that if conditions got bad, the group would relocate, and to let White know where they went, they were supposed to carve the name in the trunk of a tree. White did find a carving, two in fact. One was on a tree, and it said C-R-O, crow. And when he got closer to the palisade, he saw another one, crow a towin. Now, unfortunately for White, he didn't get a chance to chase that lead down. The winds and the currents were pretty rough, and the ship he managed to hire to come back had to return to England for repairs. And poor John White never made it back over the Atlantic. He never saw his family or any of the other settlers again. So before we explore what might have happened to the Lost Roanoke colony in those three years, I want to explore why John White took so much time to come back. And it has to do with the Spanish, which is why I spent so long setting that up. Here's my thesis. The English and the Spanish were at war with each other in the latter years of the 16th century. We'll talk about that shortly. But as a result, the Roanoke colony quickly lost its relevance. Walter Raleigh, and in turn the Queen, could no longer afford to charter ships to settle in the New World. Because they spent so much time privateering and provoking conflict with the Spanish, the Spanish decided to invade England. This event was known as the Spanish Armada in 1588. And only after the conflict ended, and the Spanish threats subsided, were any ships available to return to Roanoke. So because Roanoke was settled during the heightened period of tension between Spain and England, it was doomed. So let's talk about the Spanish Armada. King Philip II of Spain was sick of the Queen. He was tired of the constant political and religious battles, he was annoyed with the English privateers pirating his ships, and he was incensed that his Catholic ally, Mary Queen of Scots, was executed. Long story short and simplified, the Queen's spymaster uncovered a plot between Mary and an assassin to have Queen Elizabeth killed, and she was summarily executed for her crimes. But King Philip had secretly hoped all these years that he could invade England, get rid of Elizabeth, and replace her with the Catholic Mary. This would further legitimize Catholicism over all forms of Protestantism and would serve as a general victory over the pesky English. So in 1588, he leads his Spanish armada up towards London. Now at the time, because of the ample wealth from its New World colonies, Spain had the largest navy in the world. It later becomes the British Navy, right? But they're not really a thing. It's Spain. Spain's got the most ships at the time. Elizabeth knew this attack was coming, so from late 1587 onwards, she ordered all English ships, including merchant ships, to stay docked at port to help fight off the Spanish. This is all very bad timing for John White, who returned to England in November of 1587, when all the ships were ordered to stay at port. Raleigh wanted to help him and send a relief expedition to Roanoke, but the looming war with Spain prevented that from happening. As the Spanish Armada sailed up the English Channel, which is the narrow body of water that separates Britain from France, the Spanish decided to dock at Calais, the nearest French port to England, it's about 20 miles away from Dover. In a brilliant maneuver, the Spanish sent eight fire ships to Calais under the cover of darkness. Fire ships are ships filled with flammable materials that were set on fire and sent over like floating Molotov cocktails. In the darkness, the Spanish ships couldn't escape in time. And while none of them burned, it caused enough panic and disorder, which the English took full advantage of the following morning. Fleeing, and with the exit blocked by English ships, the Spanish had no choice but to sail east and then north around the British Isles the long way to head back home. Many Spanish ships were dashed on the rocky coastlines of Scotland and Ireland. Of the 150 ships that sailed with the Spanish Armada, only 65 returned. A decisive loss for Spain. Now that the threat of war was over, John White felt empowered to gather up some ships to bring him back to Roanoke. He desperately wanted to return to his daughter, his granddaughter, and the friends that he left behind. 
He had no idea that he'd be stuck in England for three years, so he feared the worst. And the worst is what he got when he discovered that the settlement and all of its people were long gone. Now, we have no idea how long the Roanoke settlers waited around for White to come back. They never made contact with any other Europeans, so they had no idea of the war with Spain or the troubles that White experienced gathering a relief expedition. I wonder if they thought that their leader abandoned them. But because of war with Spain, which, again, we can trace back to political and religious tensions, which we can further trace back to the Protestant Reformation and religious conflict in Europe, the Roanoke expedition was doomed from the start the first English colony in the Americas, and it was lost to time. When Jamestown was settled in 1607, 20 years later, the political situation was much improved. Queen Elizabeth died in 1603 and was replaced by her nephew, the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, James I. He wasn't Catholic, though. James negotiated a peace treaty with Spain so everyone could just focus on profiting off of New World riches, so the threat of war was well and truly over. With more positive fortunes on the horizon, James was persuaded to try colonizing again, and that effort became the first permanent English settlement in the New World, Jamestown. So we've looked into the history that led up to Roanoke, we've explored why John White couldn't get back home for three years, and I've mentioned the scant evidence left behind, a wooden palisade and the carving crow at Towen. Now my first instinct tells me that the colonists carved the location of where they went, It makes sense, right? The Croatoans were the most friendly indigenous group of the several that lived in and around the North Carolina coast. John White never got a chance to go to Croatoan, the island that shares a name with its people, so we don't know for certain that's what happened. It makes the most sense, though. Had there been a violent slaughter of 117 colonists, including women and children, there would have been evidence left behind at the abandoned colony. But John White couldn't find anything. No bones, no signs of violence. The boats they had were gone, the houses gone, the wood was probably repurposed elsewhere. But those are the two main categories, right? They either left or they were killed. Or perhaps they left and were killed somewhere else later. Now in 1700, an Englishman came to North Carolina and toured around a bit. He was curious about the local populations. He ended up on Roanoke Island and met a friendly group of indigenous Americans. But curiously, he noted their eyes were gray, which is an unusual color for indigenous populations. Turns out, they were Croatoans. The indigenous approached this guy and spoke to him, explaining that their ancestors were white and spoke English. They even remembered some words. It turns out, this guy had just met the great, or perhaps great-great-grandchildren of the lost Roanoke settlers. But this is just one story, one account. How can we be certain that the Roanoke colonists fled to their Croatoan neighbors and mixed in with the population? We don't have any other evidence of where they ended up, right? To this day, we haven't found the smoking gun, and by that I mean undeniable evidence of what happened. But let's take a look at some of the more modern ways historians are trying to piece together that puzzle. The most obvious solution would be archaeological evidence. If we could find tangible evidence of a 16th century European population on Roanoke Island, then that would go a long way in pinpointing where they settled, and perhaps where they went. The problem is that we haven't found a lot of conclusive evidence. Researchers with the Lost Colony Research Group think they know why. The shorelines at Roanoke have changed significantly since 1590, when John White came back looking for his people. This does make sense. I mean, erosion over time might have claimed up to half a mile of shoreline, potentially washing away the settlement and evidence of its people. To help prove their theory, volunteers spend countless hours waist-deep in the water to try to find any archaeological evidence as proof of where the colony once stood. Pot shards, coins, jewelry, anything that can be dated back to the 16th century. But on the other side of this question, though, is where the colonists went, assuming they weren't killed in Roanoke. There are a few prevailing theories, but there are two that stand out. First, that the colonists went north, where indigenous groups were generally more friendly. John White, as we know, had previously been to this area and had traveled to the western edge of the Albemarle Sound in North Carolina, and there's a potential settlement there called Site X. The second theory is that the colonists went south to Croatoan, as the carving in the woods suggested. But let's look at Site X first. Researchers at the British Museum were using technology to look at John White's map of the area. He created a very detailed map based on his two visits to this part of North Carolina. 
Researchers noticed that there were two areas on the map patched up and painted over, and they were curious about what was underneath. But tearing the patch off would damn the artifact, so that was out of the question. But science, as usual, saved the day. They were able to use backlighting and high-tech scanners to see what was underneath the patch. Lo and behold, under one of the patches was what they call Site X, a settlement that had been covered by one of these pieces of paper. Maybe this was where the colonists relocated. John White drew the map after he got back from Roanoke, but maybe he had a hunch that they would flee here. To test this theory, scientists have been using some active remote sensing in the form of LIDAR. LIDAR is a brilliant piece of technology. It's a ground-penetrating radar that can see through trees and foliage. If there are man-made structures hidden under the earth, LIDAR can find them. Fun fact, LIDAR was used to help find other hidden cities, like the lost city of the Monkey God in the Mosquitia region of Honduras, an ancient civilization about whom we know next to nothing. At Site X, LIDAR did find some potential man-made structures, but nothing conclusive. Pottery was found, but nothing that points directly to the Roanoke crew. And besides, John White on his first trip to the region in 1585 had visited this site and set up a temporary fort, so any evidence could just be from that. For me, Site X is not the likely answer. As I've said for several episodes now, let us consider Occam's razor. The simplest solution is often the correct one. We have little evidence of what happened to the Roanoke colonists, but we do know that they carved Crow and Croatoan into a tree and on a sign near their wooden palisade. Since we know from extensive primary sources that the Croatoans were friendly to the colonists, then it's more likely that the colonists were telling their leader that they went to Croatoan. The other option is that the Croatoans had killed them, but like, would they have had time to carve the name of the people who were actively murdering them into a tree? I feel like that takes a while. It reminds me of that sketch, have you seen it? The one from Monty Python on the Holy Grail, where King Arthur reads the Aramaic carving on the wall of the cave, where Joseph carves, ah, into the wall as he dies while writing. (laughs) Like Graham Chapman said in the film, he wouldn't bother to carve, ah, he'd just say it, right? I highly doubt the Roanoke colonists would carve Croatoan as they were being murdered by the Croatoans, now would they? So can we prove that the colonists went south to Croatoan? Well, maybe. We don't have definite proof yet, but there are groups trying. Scott Dawson, president and founder of the Croatoan Archaeological Society, had been doing digs of what he thinks is the site where many of the Roanoke settlers came to live after White never returned. Dawson has found several pieces of archaeological evidence that can date back to 16th century European cultures. You know, things that are definitely not from the Americas in origin because of how it's made and and the different minerals in it. Can it conclusively prove that the stuff came from Roanoke colonists? Well, again, no, but it's a good sign. What can prove that the Roanoke settlers relocated to Croatoan Island is DNA. Do you remember the indigenous guy from 1700 who approached the British explorer and told him that he descended from English settlers? Well, as it turns out, he probably was. Genealogists and researchers have been conducting studies on people who have lived on Hatteras Island, which is the new name for Croatoan, for generations. Some of these men and women have the same name as some of the first settlers from the Roanoke crew, and they always claimed from oral tradition that they were in fact the descendants of the lost colony. After doing some DNA comparisons, it turns out that they do have both indigenous and European DNA, but you need more than that to prove that you are from the Roanoke group. They needed to find some patrilineal ancestors. By examining the Y-DNA passed directly from father to son over dozens of generations, it might be possible to see if there are direct descendants to the lost Roanoke men. They're still conducting this research today, but early examinations are looking pretty good. So, therefore, here's the best theory for what happened. When John White never returned, the colonists decided to leave and find friendly indigenous groups with whom they could live. They didn't have enough supplies to last the winter, let alone for years, so they had no choice but to leave. They carved Croatoan into the tree to let White know where they went, if he ever came looking. Then they dismantled their settlement so they could trade and or give the wood and supplies to indigenous groups. They took their boats, and they headed south. Maybe some went inland, maybe some did go north. I imagine there was a lot of dissension and infighting when their leader left. But I also imagine that a bulk of the people went south to Croatoan, where their friend Manteo lived. 
They intermarried with the Croatoans, which helps explain the presence of mixed-race people there in 1700 as well as today. Though some may have been killed, it's likely that they lived the bulk of their lives with their new indigenous families and the colonists became assimilated into indigenous life. Sure, it's not the most exciting end to this mystery, but it's most likely what happened. The idea that a colony could disappear without a trace is tantalizing, but with science and logic, we know that the colonists did what they could to survive in a world where they were alone, thousands of miles from the civilization they were left behind. Thanks for joining me for this episode of A Popular History of Unpopular Things. My name is Kelly Beard, and I hope you've enjoyed the story of the lost Roanoke colony. Thank you for supporting my podcast, and if you haven't already checked out my other episodes, go have a listen. Stay tuned for my next episode as we dive into the past to uncover the weirdest, grossest, and most mysterious stories in history.